Thank you. And um, hello, everyone from uh, South Africa. It's um, good to see so many of you here, some familiar faces and other hopefully soon to be new friends. Um, I'm sure um, people are still finding their way to the various breakout rooms. So maybe just a very quick introduction. Um, my name is Sonia Blichnot. I um, come from the natural sciences, actually. I studied meteorology um, in what seems to be a, a different lifetime. I'm based in South Africa with my husband and um, three dogs. And I've been working in this field of applied complexity now for, for nearly two decades. So I love the, um, the theory. I love hanging around with the theorists. But I guess the challenge that I've been um, faced with as a practitioner and, and also just in working with people across all levels of, well, organization, but society as well, is how to make the wisdom of complexity accessible. You know, I, I, I like to think about how do we democratize complexity thinking? And so that's partly where um, the topic of my talk came from in terms of demystifying. So hopefully um, I'll, I'll get halfway there in, um, in today's talk. I'm going to try and finish a little bit um, early so that we can get to questions. So without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And so leading in complexity, you know, I, I really struggled to some extent to figure out, you know, what do I actually want to talk about? And what I've been keeping myself busy, um, you know, the last few years busy with is thinking about what does it mean to become complexity fit? And how do we enable complexity fitness? And some of what's gotten in the way is, is typically when, um, you know, you use the language of complexity you get a response that looks, you know, pretty similar to this. Um, you know, it, it reminded me a little bit of Albert Einstein, who said, you know, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. And so a lot of what I've been trying to do is, you know, really, as I said, figure out how do we make this more accessible? Because all of us already know how to navigate complexity. We are always in complexity. We actually are complexity. You know, a friend of mine, Casper, um, who I'm developing the complexity fitness work with, he, he mentioned, you know, he saw a billboard that said, you are not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. And so a key part of this is how do we make that real? And in that context, how do we lead? And so I've been, been really interested in the work of um, many of the process philosophers, and in specifically um, Edgar Murat, who said, we need to go beyond an intellectual or a conceptual understanding of complexity and move to more of an embodied or a lived complexity. So the interesting thing is that most people can describe their lived experience of complexity. They may not be able to um, define complexity. They may not be able to use, you know, the, the jargon and, and, you know, explain. Sonia, so please uh, unmute. Uh, there was background noise, and I thought I made you a co-admin. It won't mute you, but I muted you, so I apologize. Um, please, everybody, no join in or uh, just mute yourself because it's creating additional noise. Thank you, and sorry. No problem. Um, as I said, thanks. Or apologies for the really busy slide, but you know, I I thought it would be useful to just look at how do people describe their lived experience of complexity, and typically it involves things like there being too many variables to make sense of or keep track of, not knowing what to pay attention to, um, having you know surprises or unintended consequences when they try to act. You know, so no idea that this was connected to that, an overwhelming number of options and too little information to help make decisions. Um, a sense that no one can really help, not even experts. Um, problems that don't stay solved. And sometimes I, I use the, um, the analogy of trying to nail jelly to a wall. Every time you think you've, you've made a difference, it comes back again. And then this never ending fast paced change or a sense of not being able to keep up. And the emotional responses that they mention are things like confusion, feeling lost or unmoored, overwhelm and then many many people experience a lot of excitement because in all of this complexity there's also unprecedented opportunity and many people feel all of these emotions at, at once 
And so this is what I think makes it really interesting is that we all have a felt or a lived experience of complexity, but if, when it comes to leading in complexity or actually you know, having agency or acting in complexity, we find ourselves at a loss. And I think this is where you know, many or much of the thinking in the world of complexity is presented in a way that is really difficult to make sense of and really difficult to find ways to make it practical. So what I wanted to do today is share a, a lens that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, but maybe from a slightly different perspective. And that is the lens of the interplay between constraints and affordances. And maybe before we go further, just define those two words. So affordances are essentially just possibilities for action that's provided to us by our environment. They are options that we are able to act on. Some call them invitations to act. So in a way, we are in a landscape of affordances. You know, the chair we, the chairs at, you know, afford sitting on, um, a laptop affords typing on. You know, we are surrounded by affordances in, in the environment. And those are shaped by constraints. And constraints either remove or create affordances. Um, so in a, in a way, every time we make a decision, we are shaping the opportunities or the options that's available to us. And so in a very real way, our lives, our businesses, societies even are shaped by constraints that remove or create options available to us. And then also by our ability to see and to act on those options. And so there's a very, very real interplay here between our skills and abilities, what we pay attention to, but then also what the landscape around us offers to us. And I think that there's a very real um, or, or a very strong possibility here to use this thinking to make some to make leading in complexity really practical. So maybe just as a as an example that I think all of us can relate to is every choice we make changes our option landscape. You know, so when I was single, you know, I had many options available to me. Um, whenever I made a decision, it only impacted on me. So, you know, it, it was a very open landscape filled with a possibility. When you choose to enter a relationship, that creates a constraint. It removes some possibilities or options, but it also creates new ones. Over time, this relationship can you know, create the option, for example, of starting a family, of having children. If you choose to exercise that, then again, your opportunity landscape changes. Some things disappear, some options disappear. You can't you know, just only you know, pick up and go on a date, for example, if you want to. You need to organize babysitters. You need to start thinking about schooling. It changes how you spend your money. It changes how you spend your time but then it opens up completely new options or possibilities that weren't there. And every time we choose to add another person or another um, element to the mix, things become a little bit more complex. Our choices and our options impact on more people. For example, when we, you know, where we choose to live, also has a big impact on the options available to us. If you just think, for example, now um, on, you know, about things like hybrid work and ways of working, many people exercised an option to move out of the city, which is now impacting on the options available to them and things that's possible for them in terms of ways of working. And so when things are unconnected or they're connected in linear and predictable ways, our choices have limited and predictable impact. You know, and this is, I think, a way that we can potentially describe ordered systems. You know, things are not connected in nonlinear and rich ways. So in a way, making decisions um, is easier here. We still have this interplay between constraints and affordances, but the number of affordances are, are manageable and our impact tends to be quite localized. When, however, we are in rich interconnected contexts. Our option landscapes are entangled with others. Every decision we make, every constraint we put in place influences not only the options available to us, but also those available to others. And the other way around, the decisions that others make have an impact on us. And so this creates an entanglement um, that is sometimes makes it quite difficult to 
you know, predict, to know what will happen, to understand the impact of our actions, especially um, if we are in a leading role. And so as an example, if you imagine um, being in a train, around you, there are all of these options that's available to you. There's somebody sitting across from you that potentially you know, affords a conversation. There might be a bottle of water somewhere that affords drinking. You have a device that affords working on. There's a window that affords looking out there, all of these different options. But now when I provide more context, if you are in a, in a silent train car, then all of a sudden you no longer have the option to speak to somebody else that's in the same car with you. The option is there by the environment, but the constraints imposed by society or by those who make the rules on the train removes that option for you. The, that bottle of water that affords drinking doesn't belong to you. So again, depending on the context around you, who's with you in the car or the society that you're in, societal taboos might remove that option for you. So even though the environment creates choices, sometimes we're not able to exercise those choices because of where we are, the context we're in, who we are related to, who's with us, and all of these different things that shape the option landscape. And this rich dynamic entanglement creates complexity. I think there's a, a much more accessible way of defining complexity just by thinking about how dynamic these option landscapes are, how dynamic the constraints are that's, that's um, shaping them, how many variables we're dealing with, um, whether those variables are known or not, whether they're static or not. In a way, complexity is all around, you know, having too many options available, too many variables to, to make sense of in a, in a context that's shaped by dynamic constraints. And so thriving in complexity requires completely different skills. And it's about learning to move and become fit for a completely different context. And this idea of learning how to move through a different context and becoming fit um, really made me interested in looking at the various sciences that inform how humans learn to move. You know, there are many um, theories out there, for example, around how young children learn to coordinate, learn to move through, through the, their environment. And more recently, some of my friends who are in the world of sports coaching have started adapting that information to think about how can we create more adaptive players? How do we really think differently about coaching and teaching sports people to move around in whatever context they, they need to move in. And then it's really interesting because in the past, things like skill drills and a coach that give people a game plan, it worked to some extent, but it did not create you know, adaptive players who are able to adapt to an, an emerging context. And so this is where I went for, to, for inspiration. Some of the... Um, some of the thinking and some of the language might sound familiar. There are many different constraints typologies out there at the moment. And I chose to focus on this particular one because I think this is very practical in a certain sense. And it also helps us think quite differently about what it means to be fit for complexity and to lead in complexity. And so a key aspect of being in complexity is to learn. So learning in complexity is inseparable from doing and from place. You know, so it is very deeply connected to where we are and the kind of knowledge that we need, the kind of learning that we need is learning in context. It's learning by doing because it's about learning how to perceive the affordances or the options available to us and to then respond in a kind of a responsive wayfinding. So, what I found really interesting is they make a distinction between different kinds of knowledge. There's knowledge about, which is an abstracted knowledge. You know, it's, you know, me watching MasterChef or reading a recipe book versus, you know, knowledge of, which is an embedded knowledge that you get by, you know, actually experience, experiencing something. So actually cooking and wayfinding and learning and complexity really needs to create this 
embedded knowledge of. And many of us already have this because, you know, as we established right in the beginning, we're all already navigating complexity. You know, if you think about it, your body is complex. Um, you have a complex gut bi biome, a complex immune system. You are in a complex family. Uh, you are in, you live in a complex city, you go on holiday in complex ecosystems. So we already know how to navigate complexity. But for some reason, when we take it into the work environment, and especially when we start thinking about how do we lead in uncertainty, how do we create agile cultures, how do we shift the culture, how do we break into new markets, all of these complex questions, it's very hard for us to translate our knowledge of you know, being in complexity in our normal lives into those contexts. And so a key part of leading in complexity involves creating enabling conditions for collective wayfinding and learning. And it's really interesting, as I was doing research for this talk, I came across um, a reference to the original um, etymology of the word education, which comes from a word I can't pronounce, but it means lead someone out into the world. And this is a very different way of thinking about learning, especially in our context that is so heavily focused on training. And it almost has this idea of pouring existing knowledge into an empty vessel. Seeing education as leading someone out into the world is a very different way of thinking about it. And what I really like about this is it makes a link between leading and learning. And so in complexity, leaders need to always be learning themselves, but then they also need to create contexts that enable learning. It's almost like creating true learning organizations, because what we're all engaged with at the moment is collective wayfinding, because our context is changing at such a pace. We have to continually find our way. There are very few stable contexts available to us. And the way that we do this is by managing constraints. I think it's Dave Snowden who says, um, in complexity, leaders or managers need to shift from being constraints to managing constraints. And there's such a key here because it's not only learning that we can enable in this way by managing constraints. It's also a way for us to enable emergence. You know, so, so many of the things that we want to create as leaders, so for example, a particular culture or agility or adaptive capacity, even things like psychological safety. Those are all emergent properties of a complex system. We can't create or design them. They emerge from the context. You know, and we can use this in, in any context. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, we decided long ago that we want to create um, a little ecosystem in our garden. We live in a city, we live in a typical suburb, so we're surrounded by pretty sterile, um, you know, houses and gardens, and we don't have many parks around, and we really wanted to create an ecosystem. Now, there's no way to mandate. I can't call particular birds and tell them to come to my garden. I All I can do is to create the conditions, and so we decided to have a fully indigenous garden. Um, I had a list on that list, you know, they were all lists of plants that either attracted butterflies or insects or attracted birds. And if you didn't attract anything, you weren't on my list. And so over time, this was 20 years ago, we started planting and creating an invitation for the wildlife that we hoped would come. And now we have a garden where there's about 50 different bird species. We have hawks. We even have, um, you know, a couple of, you know, wild um, animals that you don't normally find in, in gardens. But there was no way that I could mandate or create that. All I could do was create the conditions for it. And we did that by imposing constraints, choosing particular plants, for example. And so, there are three kinds of constraints that influence the development of movement and coordination. And again, I chose to focus on this for this particular talk because wayfinding in complexity involves moving through a very different kind of landscape. And so understanding what the various constraints are that help 
co coordination and movement and fitness to emerge, I think is really helpful in, in this context. So these three constraints are quite different from some of the others that you might, might have encountered, but I think that I personally find them very useful. So the first, um, and I'm going to give you examples from the world of sport first, before I take it to the world of, of leadership, is player constraints. So this has to do with the physical, with the human. So there are physical constraints like height, muscle mass, age, and then there are psychological constraints like motivation, emotions, agency, you know, do they have internal or external locus of control? All of these things need to be taken into account when you want to create contexts for someone to move through. You know, so the key here is you are not going to create the same kind of skills draw for a child of six than for an adult of, you know, 21. All of you know, that, the, the physical characteristics are different and we need to take that into account. Second are task constraints. And this has to do with what are we busy with? Um, for example, what are the rules that govern the game? Um, are we practicing or are we actually busy with an actual game? Um, what, are the, what is it that we, that we want to achieve? How do we score? Uh, what are the tools and the resources we, we need to perform this task? Are things set up in a way that's cooperative or competitive? What is the size of the team? Where are the players positioned? What is the scope? What is the time frame? All of these relate to the particular task. What are we here to do? And then thirdly, we have environmental constraints. So here, some again are material or physical. So it's, it's the surface we're playing on. Is it on grass? Is it on concrete? Is it on sand? Weather? Um, you know, all kinds of, are we playing in a, in, a, in a large stadium or in a small informal setting? Then there's social constraints, you know, so what are peer and parent expectations in this particular context? What are the stories and definitions of success? You know, if you think, for example, of a country like New Zealand and the role that rugby plays there, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, like a, a, a form of spirituality. It's very deeply ingrained in the culture. How they perceive the sport and how they um, interact with players, how they see the development of, of sport in that context is very different um, than an, another country, you know, like Brazil, for example, where rugby is of equal importance potentially, or I think there it's more football, but the context is very different. And then interestingly enough, also language, and I'm going to make a little bit of a sidetrack there um, shortly, Environmental constraints are typically the ambient conditions um, where the, the sport or the activity will, will play out. And sports coaches or, or captains, team leaders, they have control mostly over the task constraints, but then we can also influence things like, you know, the skill levels of players. There's some, some influence over the environmental constraint, but mostly it's on task. And this work comes from, I adapted it from my friend Marco Sullivan's work. He did his PhD in, in this field. So if you want to do more reading, that's a great place to start. So maybe to bring it across um, into the world of leadership. And I think this applies across various levels from individual coaching, even just coaching yourself and making sense of your own context and what options are available to you also to teams or to entire organizations. So here again, individual constraints. What skills and experience do people have? Do we have sufficient diversity in that? Or do we need to think about you know, bringing in new skills, new diversity, or new um, ways of looking at the world? What is their energy levels and well-being like? You know, in post-pandemic world now, many of us are sitting with a workforce that is very near to burnout. There are only, you know, that removes certain options for us, especially when we expect people to show up with curiosity and to be excited by the uncertainty. What is their motivation and agency and how are they disposed to change and uncertainty? One of the reasons why I like this particular framework is it, it shows the entanglement between the individual the task and the context, the individual and the collective. Um, I don't think we can ever remove the, in, the individual with all of their quirks, you know, their levels of skill and experience, as well as their psychological dispositions from this equation. 
but then we focused on that for too long on changing individuals but so this framework recognizes that individual that there's constraints related to individuals but it puts it in context then the task constraints what are we trying to achieve is that task clear you know sometimes we talk about intent what are we here to do what are the rules that govern how we work do they limit our options sufficiently or too much you know sometimes i think we don't think through the impact that some of our decisions have you know especially if you think for example of some of the things that um, the rules that got imposed now with hybrid work um, we didn't think about the impact and how it rippled through to some of our you know some of the options that our employees have to exercise what resources do we need and are they available do our incentives encourage collaboration or competition do our incentives actually the constraints linked to our incentives will they lead to unintended consequences very often in organizations we don't think through our incentives, the targets we set, and in the end, we get the opposite of what we want. We might want agility, but then you know, our, our incentives actually um, you know, incentivize people not to be agile, not to fail, not to work, work together across organizational boundaries. What time scales and rhythms matter? And then again, language. And then finally, the environmental constraints. So what are the rules that govern our industry or the country you operate in? What is valued here? How do we define success here? You know, this is very different when you are in a, in a heavily, you know, like a capitalist individualist society versus more of an egalitarian society. What are the macroeconomic factors that impact on our business? What beliefs shape the prevailing culture? And then what, what markets do we have access to? And then again, what language is used? And I want a quick aside here on language, because this is something that I've realized recently is just how much of a constraint language can be. This comes from a book by Wade Davis, where he talks about language not only being a medium of communication, but a means of constructing reality. Um, language shapes our thoughts, our perceptions, our values, and our spirit. And they provide the categories through which we think and the sounds we use to express thought. And if you think about it, our language, we use in, in most Western languages, with, it's very noun heavy. You know, and nouns are used to name things. They're used to you know, determine what category something fits in. You know, it's, a, it's a label. And very often our nouns make things static, but we use it to describe dynamic contexts. So when you think about it, there's a really big difference between leading and leadership, leading as a verb, as a dynamic process, leadership as a, um, as a noun is a static you know, thing in a, in a way that's situated in a particular person, in a leader, which is again a noun. Um, even things like um, change, very often we, use, we see change as a noun, we see complexity as a noun whereas complexity is much better described as a verb. So we need to think about the language we use, what we encourage. And I think sometimes it's useful even to create a completely new language that can support the dynamic wayfinding that, that we want to install. And so finally, just want to wrap this up in, in, in a framework that you may have seen before. And if we bring all of this together, we can create a holding environment for wayfinding. And so to make this very practical, you can use the constraints framework we just, um, I, I just talked you through to really think through as a leader, um, where do I have some influence and where are constraints that I simply have to work within? It's almost a, a first mapping that you can do to situate yourself and what you have to work with. So that is a, a way of orienting. Where are we now? What do we have available? And what are the potential adjacent possibilities from where we are now? Also, from there, we set direction and intent. Where are we going and why? What is our primary task? You know, this almost creates a task landscape that people can situate themselves in. But the key here is that it creates a bounded space, especially when we add the others. You know, so we need to acknowledge or set limits. Where can't we go? 
So what are the player constraints we can do nothing about? These are the people that we have to work with now. Yes, they will develop new skills as we start moving, but where are they now? What are the environmental constraints that we can do nothing about? These could be laws that we need to function within. You know, these could be budget constraints. It could be anything that we simply have no influence over. We need to acknowledge them and then work within them. And then finally, we need to set boundaries to, to limit the number of options available to us because too many options sometimes can be paralyzing. So we need to set boundaries. Humans need boundaries. We all we learn that with children. Um, we don't feel safe to explore if we're in a completely unbounded space. You know, artists talk about you know the paralysis that sits in with a blank canvas. So what do we choose not to focus on? Who do we choose not to be? How do we choose to show up? How do we know if we belong or if we don't belong? All of these come from boundaries. And within this space, we can then start creating um, enabling conditions. So we can make sure that the resources, for example, are there to enable wayfinding and learning, time, skills, budget, capacity. You know, do we have energy? Do we have time to pay attention? Do we have slack in the system? Do we have a requisite diversity so that we have the ability to adapt? Connectivity and access is really interesting. You know, in complexity, it really matters who is next to who. You know, who is connected? Um, who can I learn from? Who are the experienced guides or mentors that can help me move through this landscape that can show me what to pay attention to without telling me what to do? So who is connected to who and who is proximate to who? Those are important things in complexity. We need to enable the flow of information and then we also need to enable the flow of authority and mandates. Um, it's no, very often our, wayfinding efforts fail because people don't have the necessary authority to act on the um, constraints or the, on the affordances that they perceive. And then finally, we need to enable feedback flows because that's where our responsiveness come from. Um, and this is peer, peer, it enables peer learning, it enables cross-pollination of ideas, it enables serendipity to some extent. And the key here is that understanding that wayfinding involves responsive detailed engagement with an unfolding continuous changing environment. So if we don't have um, feedback, if we don't have the necessary feedback in place, we've got nothing to respond to. And I, I really love this, this idea from Carl Woods where he says, no one nor thing should be seen as having all the answers. Answers emerge as people head out into the world to, together. I think that is the invitation to us in complexity and especially to us as you know who are um, taking up leading roles in complexity is this is not about knowing answers this is not about knowing where you go it is about figuring things out with the others around you and creating the context that enable that and so one final quote this is by Tim Ingold and I really encourage you to to read more about his work um, he says to embark on any venture whether it be to set out for a walk, to hunt an animal or to sail the seas, is to cast off into the stream of a world in becoming with no knowing what will transpire. And I think this is partly what makes complexity so beautiful and what makes you know, uncertainty something that we don't necessarily have to be anxious about. Because if everything was known, it would be impossible for us to have adventures. But sometimes we can get anxious when we find ourselves in this world where we can't know before we go, we learn, we know as we go. And so finally, these are um, four uh, meta skills that we use when we um, take people through journeys to become complexity fit. And these four, we talk about being cool in complexity. And I want to leave you with this because it's it's easily mem memorable, but this is almost, I think, what the complexity is inviting us into. So for us to be able to manage constraints, for us to be able to act on the affordances in our landscapes, we need courage to let go of the familiar. We need openness to explore much more broadly and to engage with different pers pers perspectives. We need the ability to observe not only the patterns and the context around us, but also our inner responses. And then we need to do all of this with light 
lightness, holding our own ego lightly, um, being willi willing to play and seeing the beauty that's, that's all around us. And so that is it from me. I'm going to stop sharing. And in the time available, I'm not sure how much time there is, um, open for questions or comments. I yeah, feel I'm like that. About 10 minutes, but thank you, Sonia. Yeah, so we'll take questions, maybe put them in the, in the chat. That might be easier. Um, there was already one question uh, here from Rebecca. I have one question. Can you hear me? Sure. Can you hear me? I know you've been breaking up earlier, Michelle. Uh, Yeah, I, I I don't think his connection is. Uh, so Sonia, let's go with this question here. Uh, how can we apply the managing constraints framework to the creation of healthy project teams at work? Hi, Rebecca. I think, you know, it's just applying this thinking, I think is, is already pretty different to the way that we normally think about creating healthy project teams at, at work. You know, so if you know, maybe a place to start would be, and this would be different from team to team. You know, so if, if you just think back to that framework, um, what are the individual constraints in this particular team? You know, is it a, a team of very experienced people or a team of novices? Um, is it a, a very diverse team? Is it, you know, is it a, a team that has to work under high pressure or not, not so much? You know, so that's one aspect. Then to think about the task constraints. So, for example, are the roles and the tasks, the intent, what this, this team is there to do, are those clear? Um, if not, how do we intervene? Um, think about if they have the resources they, they need. Um, you know, even think about the, you know, if, if the, the context that we've created is contained enough. You know, one of the, the things that we didn't get to is the need for leaders to have the ability to create some form of containment for anxiety and you know all, all kinds of other emotions that that's at play because it's in that contained space that we can have safety where things like psychological safety emerges and then also to acknowledge what the environmental constraints are you know sometimes a team is functioning within the context of you know a pretty toxic culture so then a question becomes, you know, as a, you know, leading that team is how do we create a, a buffer, a container, you know, that almost buffers the team from, from that. Or, you know, maybe it's, it's simply helping a team to, to cope with and deal with a really fast paced environment. So I think it starts with just mapping where you are and exactly what it is that you're dealing with. And to understand that the health of the team will emerge as you create the conditions for it. It is not something that you can mandate or that you can engineer. I, I hope that helps, Rebecca. Great. Um, there's another question here. Um, let me just see up here. Um, how do you lead um, effectively and courageously in an environment where leaders are usually seen treated as scapegoats if they don't have all the answers? Sure, I don't think there is a, an easy answer to, to that one. <laughs> um, I, I think it's quite pervasive um, in many cultures that you know, if, if you just think of, of even just the movies we we watch, and typically what comes to mind when we think of a leader, you know, it's it's typically someone who has the answers, someone who knows where they're going. You know, it's a it's very different from a wayfinding leader that enables others. And so this is not something that only belongs to particular contexts. I think this is almost like the the prevailing narrative. Mm -hmm. And to an extent, you know, that is, is something that we just simply need to acknowledge is there, but it's, it's something that we can only really shift by acting differently in that landscape. You know, in many organizations, when you start showing particular results, that is when people start, start listening. But, and I think I'm rambling a little bit, but I think maybe just to give you some hope is the post-pandemic context what I've noticed is that there's a much more 
a broader acceptance of complexity. It's as if more people understand that they are in complexity and that they need to do things differently. So it's started to shift, but some of these dominant narratives are still very entrenched, you know, and I think the challenge for us is to start acting in ways that create counter narratives that we can amplify over time. Yeah, and, and there, there's a common theme. There's one more question here. How do we deal with leaders that are complexity agnostic? Um, sorry, I just moved up. Uh, and still tries to hold on to scientific rationality. I think, you know, that's something, Sonia, that you and I talked in, in the podcast that I had with you. But like, you know, the, the, there is understanding of complexity and your tolerance to deal with the complexity. But there's also inner work. A lot of times, and maybe you can, uh, you know, elaborate on that, that, that discussion that we have about, you know, leaders working on themselves, how they make sense of things, how they perceive things, because um, I think that's one big part uh, of, of dealing with complexity. How well do you actually make sense of the complexity that you're in? Yeah, and that that question keeps coming up. You know, how do we how do we deal with leaders who are not you know who who are not bought into this thing of complexity? And and I, I think I've got a lot of empathy um, with leaders who find themselves there because you know if you think about it, you climbed the ladder, you got to where you are because you were really good in that system where. You had to know the answers. You could tell people what to do. You know, it's 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 where many of us feel comfortable, and it gives us a sense of control. I think that's another thing: is we feel that we have some control and we can create some certainty, and that gives us comfort. To shift from that, as you said, Mejan, we we very often need to engage in in inner work, because very often also leaders are surrounded by people who are afraid to challenge them, who will not speak truth. And we, we sometimes just need to acknowledge that, you know, this is, it's not that we've become incompetent leaders overnight. It's that the context has shifted to such an extent that the ways that we learned to act, the ways we learned to move in the landscape is no longer appropriate. Um, but there are, I think this is why there's such an explosion in, in, in the need and the, the value that people find in coaching. I think it's, it's, you know, people are starting to realize that they need to do things differently. They need to find new ways of, of functioning, but they're not sure how. Um, but yes, I, I think there are, are probably there's a, a bigger need for, for leaders to, to engage in you know, to, to really get the feedback they need and to engage in inner work and, and getting comfortable with uncertainty themselves because you can't lead others in uncertainty if you are not comfortable there. I think that has been one of my biggest learnings is I can't be out here telling people to embrace complexity and emergence and uncertainty if I'm not able to do it. And I think that is a, a, a key for, for anyone in a, in a leading role. And as um, Sven said it in the comment, it's not only not only leaders. This is a human thing. We like certainty. We like to be comfortable. We like knowing, you know. And and I think this is just something that that we need to acknowledge and then figure out how do we move forward. <laughs>